So let me welcome to the stage somebody I've admired for many years, somebody I'm happy to consider a friend. Shake a little go. Don't jump, yes. You know, we were talking last night when we were talking about the ministry of tolerance. I talked about how religious tolerance is such a challenge around the world today, and you stopped me. You said, it's not just about religion. Explain that. Well, when you talk about tolerance, you're actually talking about coexistence as well. And I believe um, in this environment of today, if, um, this uh, day and age, uh, with the mobilization of people for work, um, you need more than just religion. Religion is just one aspect of tolerance or coexistence. Um, prejudices sometimes comes more related to culture than religion. I think if you look at all religions worldwide, you'll find that there's a common denominator of values. These values um, related to humanity and human beings that we don't kill, we don't hate, um, we, we should have love for one another, we should be kind. So what happened from the core value of the religion itself and where did it go? Um, like everything else, I think even religions got politicized. And this changes that's happening is starting to impact us everywhere. But why would a place like United Arab Emirates would think about a national program for tolerance or even appointing a minister of state for tolerance? Um, we look at it from two sides. One, UAE is considered a very tolerant society. We have over 200 nationalities. We have uh, over 120 churches throughout the UAE. We have Hindu mm. temples, Sikh temples. And uh, the idea here is not that we lack tolerance, but rather try to preserve a legacy that we live by. And we, when we wanted to develop this program, I was given a plan sheet and saying develop it. I went around and I asked. I wanted to know whether this is a program of a message from the UAE abroad, or this is a program that we need to actually make sure that exists in here. But most importantly, like every other ministry I had before, um, usually the prime ministers talk to us as you are entrusted with a responsibility. We need to maintain a good legacy for the youth, so for the next mm. generations to come. So um, in, this, uh, in this idea, um, the, the notion came from two aspects. One, that we need to maintain this legacy that we have. We worked it very well. And um, you may think this is all about value, but in reality, it's really more about economic formula. UAE um, was fortunate to have oil in the 70s. And with this wealth that we had, we also are a small nation. Uh, priorities um, for the government was to educate people, um, make sure that we have the right environment, uh, create uh, free health for the nations. But that was not good enough for us. You don't want to create a social welfare because you have so much wealth and you have a small nation. So the idea was to increase um, the economic base. And with that, st which started in the 80s, um, the drive was actually for economic diversification. So first decade was really more about educating, creating the base for us and the foundation. And then moving from there um, to create a diversification in our economy. But when you do that, you need to make sure that you invite people to come in. There are good reasons for them not only to come and come and go, but to stay. And we've had some of the uh, nationals here for three generations now. So the idea is, what constitutes a level of living that can encourage people to stay here? First of all, security and safety. This is the most important aspect for anyone who would move from one country to another. And for us, it wasn't about being a policing country as much as it was just an environment so people feel safe. And we felt that uh, during the Gulf War, we had so many people in here. And then out of the blue, when this whole threat about the Gulf War, people just left. They just got up and left. And we thought, wait a minute. Mm. There is something here that we need to make sure that exists. People will not stay. Second, it was about their religious freedom and their faith. So we had to be open about this. And if you look at the constitution of the UAE, it actually supports that very, uh, very well. And exercising rule of the law. Um, the rules and the regulations are meant to be respected by everyone, including the nationals. So it's not just about us 
uh, and not the others. People come here as partners. They come to contribute to our economy, so they win, we win. So our outlook and the way we look at people who live in the UAE, we look at them as partners. Mm -hmm. They make the future, they make the wealth and the, the growth in their society. Um, so from that aspect, um, I think this idea of tolerance is we've, we've had it, we worked on it as part of our economic formula, but we took it for granted. Today, you find, whether it's from challenging region or worldwide, the rhetoric has changed. There is too much negativity uh, happening at the moment. And there is a lot that can be influenced directly through the internet and on social media. So we need to protect this legacy. We need to institutionalize it and make sure that almost in every aspect that we have, and we created this national program, and you can find it on the, uh, on the ministry's website in Arabic and in English. But there is another story. The other part for us is youth. Mm. We have seen so much of radicalization taking place worldwide. When you could be sitting in a room with your kids, and you assume they're sitting with you, but they're not really with you. They're somewhere else. They're on a different planet. And um, youth need some guidance. They need someone to bring the grassroots and the values we lived by. Um, we take it for granted. We, we transcended this from our parents and grandparents. But in reality, you can't do this anymore with your kids. Your kids have an opinion. I had an opinion when I was 22, when I was at the university. Mm. The kids today, they have an opinion when they're five years old. <laughs> and even some, I think, have it at three. <laughs> so the idea here is how do you protect them? How do you actually immunize them from radicalization and extremism? Well, what is the answer there? Well, the answer is first, you need to bring this value as tolerance, um, as, as a basic uh, idea or a thought that there should be uh, incorporated, whether it's in curriculum and lifestyle and everything where people live. But at the same time, um, while you immunize them, you need to make sure what goes on in the internet that you fully understand. So within, within this aspect, um, we'd find that there are, um, whether it's from the Islamic side or um, um, you, you find what we call fatwa, and that's basically giving advices to young people to understand if someone mm -hmm. Um, put a, politi a politicized uh, fatwa or a, a guidance or a, a thought about Islam that was wrong, something was taken out of context. Today you'll find websites that actually can, uh, can be a good reference for the youth. Um, so that's one aspect, but youth worldwide um, will stick by that if you have something for them. So um, for the United Arab Emirates to create a minister of state for youth is, was very crucial. Um, you can advise, you can guide youth, but if you don't have a program for them where you know you can secure their future, today the future is different. And I think the, the best way that was given here is the introduction of the Hyperloop. What's happening now is there is a trend of changes that um, uh, was mentioned earlier when we talk about the um, uh, fourth generation uh, of revolution, of industrial revolution. Um, Today, the, the jobs have changed. The type of jobs that we have are no longer the same. Mm -hmm. We could assume that uh, uh, the Red Ricks in the US or other places or in, in Europe, that this is all about globalization. But in reality, um, we will have um, driverless trucks taking intermodal of, uh, of cargo all around cities. You have cars. I mean, there are a lot of jobs that are going to be lost. Uh, even in the medical care, things has changed in the way we get diagnosed. You can do it out of home. You're not going to go in a cluster of hospital and clinics and all kinds of things. So the, the world is changing. How do you cope with this change? And the change is going very fast. So for us, it's really more about focusing on delivering future by giving opportunities, whether it's from innovation, encouraging um, kids to look at different aspects of whether it's space or anything else but that you, they have a choice. They have other, other things to look at. Our generation and yours was, I mean, our generation was more about you graduate to look for a job, mm. but this is no longer the case. A lot of kids today, they want a future of their own that where they're individualized. You know, last night we were talking about the cultural versus the religious aspects of tolerance within Islam, and you looked at it through a lens of women. Why don't you uh, talk about that a little bit more? Well, sometimes people get mixed up when they talk about religion and when they talk about, in particular, to Islam. It's always about that, the, it, that it's 
it's the Islamic religion that actually uh, uh, discourage women from working or driving cars or whatever. But in reality, I think if you look at it or, or any other aspects of uh, uh, trying to cast negativity on Islam, Islam is like any other religion. It talks about values and virtues, and it talks about uh, the consciousness of how you deal with other people. But the problem is um, the, what, what changes or influences society is really more of culture than religion. And uh, the easiest example for me, if someone talks about Muslim women, I'd say just visualize women all the way from Afghanistan to North Africa. And in, in, uh, just visualize a woman from Lebanon or from Jordan or from the UAE, or from the GCC or from Pakistan or Afghanistan, they don't look the same. They don't have the same kind of rights in, in a way, but that's really more of a, a society that's, uh, that's actually um, um, driving um, that, that decision for or fate for these women. Um, and it's not really a religion. Religion really doesn't touch on that, on that aspect. So how do you use your ministry of tolerance to stop some of the radicalization, whether it's within Islam or, for that matter, in every other religion? Um, internally, in our program, we look at two parts. Um, one, cohesive family, and the other part is youth. So immunizing um, youth from radicalization. We work in collaboration with organizations that look for that. We have Sawab, we have Hidayah. Um, Al-Azhar has also put some programs in, in that aspect. But the idea here is to direct the youth to the proper meaning of Islam, what it means, and also to be uh, able to understand that if someone's trying to sell the wrong idea to you, that you have a reference, so you can go to somebody and ask that your intelligence is really more about where you are within your program. Cohesive families, uh, uh, sometimes we, we find, even in a society, a traditional society like UAE, that maybe things do change over time. Uh, parents are busy, um, kids look for advice somewhere else. They're not really looking at the parents for guidance or the community. We lived in a community where your extended family is right next door. People are different today. So cohesive family means that we need to understand that values um, should be there, should be um, taught well. Um, but we also look at schools, we look at education. Um, sometimes uh, in a place like United Arab Emirates, we have a lot of teachers, they're not all from UAE. Um, you may think that you have the proper curriculum for the students, but you never think about the teacher, whether the teacher has their own ideas influenced by where they came from or that, that they have an influence over the kids as well. So one of the things that we launched was a charter when it talks about tolerance, um, committing um, uh, different parts of the society, including teachers, to really understand what tolerance, that this is not for you to advocate hatred or discrimination. And we have a law enactment, uh, uh, enactment of uh, um, anti-discrimination law um, that was uh, launched in 2015. And within this, again, um, we talk about not only just religion, but race, ethnic uh, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. We talked this morning, uh, a lot of the talk was about the rise of a populism uh, throughout the world, especially Europe and the United States. That populism is almost a tribalism, too, or a nationalism, all rolled into one. Has that hurt the notion of tolerance? And do you agree with what was said this morning about the rise of populism? I think we had incredible speakers this morning. I mean, for, for, for me, it was just laying out the scene worldwide and, and how we look at it. Uh, uh, populism is going to, I think, is on the rise. And part of it is mistrust. Um, maybe we think about globalization as a reason for that, but um, I'm going to focus on one society that I um, very much have very strong affinity with because I went to school in California. I look at the states. Um, if you look at Northern California with a lot of in Silicon Valley and technology companies, it is, it's not really all about you know, jobs going to Asia and getting cheaper product. You have um, a highly educated um, uh, um, layer of people, I mean, a, a group of people, uh, Asian predominantly, going to the US for job opportunities and technology. So one, one aspect, I think, is really to look back at the education and to see whether um, even when you have 
um, we, you know, you have technologies that are coming and they're changing the world. Are you equipped within your own, within your own society that you have the right education for the, for the kids? Do they know that this is really what's critical mm -hmm. and that's a survival issue? Um, so it's not just about the jobs that are going. Um, U.S. has always been the hot spot for innovation and, and creativity and technology. We see it in Boston. We see it in California. And I, uh, but you walk into um, a good example for me is Oracle because I, I used to go to Oracle quite a lot. Uh, and um, you walk in um, in the cafeteria, um, you walk around. It's it looks like it's in Mumbai or That's maybe cool. in uh, Delhi, but it doesn't look like the U.S. anymore. So uh, competition for these jobs means that there should be a focus on youth. And that's really the drive right now within the UAE that to really focus on giving an opportunity for the, for the kids here to look for um, the right jobs and to look for it's no longer government jobs that are secure, but to look for innovation, creativity, mm -hmm. and encourage them to start their own thoughts as well. Let me open it up if uh, some questions or thoughts. Is that in the, I don't know. Well, while we're waiting for people to come up with their uh, brilliant questions, um, you talked about you know places like California, places like Mumbai, and even here, Media City uh, near uh, Dubai, uh, as being places of great creativity. But isn't one of the divides in our society between sort of urban, you know, cosmopolitan areas that have creative jobs? and then people who feel they've been left out. I think that's very, very important. In a place like UA, because it's small, right. maybe it's different. But I'll give you a good example here. Mm -hmm. We have Strata in Al Ain. Al Ain is considered more of an oasis, really not mainstream capital like Abu Dhabi yeah. in terms of the jobs. However, um, smartly, uh, Strata was actually established as a manufacturing for airspace that produces three parts of Airbus and Boeing. And it was stated right next to um, Alain, where you have university graduates from Alain who are engineers. Well, guess what? 70% of the engineers are women who actually work in, in, that, uh, in that place. So the idea is, how do you, how do you create the, the, um, an equi equ equilibrium, I would say, between um, remote areas, and, and uh, I don't think any society is, in, is immune to that. You, you, you need to focus on some areas as well as remote, but um, the, the important part is you have, to f you have to look at strategy within the country to see how you can balance, because um, you can't move everyone from, uh, from mm -hmm. one place. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking a little bit about immigration, both here on stage this morning, but also last night. I know Syrian immigration has been something that's helped disrupt a lot of what's happening in Europe, but it's something the UAE has been in very involved with, both in the camps in, yes. in the region and to some extent here. How do you deal with that and the notion of tolerance? Well, um, f for us, when, when we look at this from my previous job, I visited the refugees camps quite a lot in, uh, in uh, Jordan. Uh, the, the camps we have got expanded over the year, um, whereby we, I think we accommodate about 15,000, but we, there are a lot of people who did some contribution of work also in the Zakari and some other place as well. But f for us, keeping the Syrians close to their borders was very crucial politically. Um, you don't want people to end up in Finland or in Oslo or Norway, and um, they'll never come back to Syria. So the idea is within these camps, you need to create jobs for them, training. Um, as president of Zaid University, the girls who volunteer every year to go on a weekly basis to a refugees camp in Jordan surprised me with a the project. They came back and they said, well, the women don't have sewing machine. And we see the kids with their clothes, but they're not really that great. Can we actually raise funds for the, for the women, Syrian women, refugees in that camp? And so they did. So th now they've got a, one of these projects. But within, within the camp itself, we have several other projects of training the men for uh, being electrician and carp uh, carpentry. And they work and they get paid within the camp itself. But I go back to the, the real issue here um, when it comes to the Syrian refugees. Um, the number of displaced people in general is quite large nowadays, and that's one of the challenges facing the world. But in particular with the Syrian refugees, um, not solving the political problem, it only added this other problem. 
um, were trying to handle um, uh, refugees, um, the Syrian refugees within Europe. This has put a lot of stress not only on, on the EU. Um, you know, you talk about Germany. Mm -hmm. It's not really just Germany. Um, for the Syrians to reach to Germany, they had to go through a lot of small European countries who did not have the budget to cope with it. They had the most stress as well. But I look at uh, uh, Jordan uh, or Lebanon. Jordan has been stressed uh, as a host country with the number of uh, refugees that are coming um, uh, to Jordan itself. And for us, the support for the host country was very crucial as well. So what else should we be doing? Uh, support for the host countries? How else do we deal with this? Solve the main problem. Syria. Syria, you have to solve the problem. Yeah. I, I think maybe one of the trends that we didn't really talk much about, uh, what I've seen personally in the last five, six, year, six years is the trend of head states actually sitting in a room and dialoguing doesn't happen mm -hmm. enough. Um, it's it really... Uh, uh, we've had other wars and other problems before, but I, it just the sense that the leaders are not really sitting in the same room and, and focusing on the, on the interest of people worldwide. Mm -hmm. So uh, the refugees is a consequential problem of a, of a main problem that was not solved before. We will make you Minister of Foreign Affairs as your next assignment. <laughs> uh, anybody, uh, yes, Gideon. Gideon and then I think was that there? Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I think you're right. Uh, today, I think this this idea of uh, focusing on um, Islamophobia and uh, maybe running more of the rhetoric so what that feeds into the frenzy of ISIS and the others. I mean, it only proves a point for them saying, "Look, they hate you." Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, it will it will ignite and incite more problems uh, than actually looking. I don't think. Um, this business of uh, screening people through U.S. is not new. Um, it happens in Europe as well. It happens here. But it was done in a different way. Um, I'm, by the way, one of the most screened people when I used to go to the U.S. the minute I leave mm -hmm. New York and Washington, D.C. But sometimes I think it has to do with maybe a, a person at immigration who, who thought maybe that was his job. Um, so, yes. Um, but if you were a minister of tolerance in the U.S., yeah. Wouldn't you set the tone that it's not your job to make people feel uncomfortable? Well, I, I think however countries want to produce this program or, or, or put it in, there are different ways of delivering. It doesn't have to be the way we delivered. It just can be under one umbrella of uh, Ministry of Culture. It could be through certain regulation. Um, but in this, in this world where globalization had its impact of people, people's mobility, um, this idea of um, uh, labeling people, I, I think it's only going to create danger. And we've seen the sentiment in the, in the US and other places where it's just become more of an emotional issue rather than, uh, than the, the actual political issue. I, I was just hoping you could comment a little more from your experience being in uh, the U.S. and now with this amazing program as Ministry of Tolerance. Do you have your own perspectives on what, how some of the lessons learned or opportunities that we might look at in the, in the U.S. as an example uh, to try to promote these kinds of dialogues and whether it's dialogues at the head of state or dialogues even um, amongst youth and yeah. children and people uh, from different backgrounds of, of some of the baby steps we might mm -hmm. think about approaching uh, to address these issues? Well, you know, when I look at the U.S. SAWAB as a program where we actually combat people on social media when it comes to um, Islamic rhetorics that are wrong, 
this is a pro joint program between the government of the USA and us. So mm. um, it's not that the U.S. It doesn't exist. I, I think well, tell us, are, we have a Stevens Initiative at the Aspen Institute yeah. through the U.S. government, too. Tell us about that program. Um, no, I mean, your program. That uh, you're my, uh, so for, for me, I think in, in the U.S., uh, uh, th these programs do exist in terms of collaboration with, uh, with the UAE and other countries, and I think there's a lot of, uh, not only just dialogue, but there are a lot of cooperation. Um, we just, I think we need to just calm a little bit in the US and just let the dust settle, and then things will be okay. Um, there, there's, just, there's just too much animosity of, of people, and I think uh, I credit that to the social media, <laughs> social media sometimes, I think takes things uh, beyond its limits. And uh, we talked about fake news. And today, sometimes, uh, you find a lot of uh, facts. I mean, how, how many times that I've received things from people who I said, you know, you need to check your facts because this is not true. Whether someone is saying sticking and um, maybe an ear, um, you know, a branch of a tree in your ear would create a, a better tetanus uh, solution for your illness or something. I mean, people come up with bizarre things, but people never check, um, and they tend to just retweet and send things. So um, we need, we all need to be realistic about what we look at. Um, but you know, as we say in Arabic, you, you you can't have you can't clap with one hand. You need two. So we, we all need to really start thinking about how we can change this, uh, this output that's happening at the moment. But um, think, I, I think regardless um, of what's happening today, we need to go back and think, whether it's the US, whether it's Europe, whether it's in Asia, none of us, actually our ancestors came from the same place. We all started as immigrants at some point. Um, so it's not, this is not something new where we start fighting um, immigration and, and look at it differently. But um, today it's a nomadic society, it's a, and especially with the youth. If I've got a better job somewhere else that I believe I can contribute that make well for myself, I'll go. And if the environment is not set enough for me to be good, then I'll move back or I'll go somewhere else. So you have this new nation of, of uh, of young people who are not tied to their own origin anymore. It's just, it's a different world. But let me take you right back to the social media question. What are you doing here to combat the divisiveness that social media could cause? And what would you like to be able to do that you can't do, but you wish you could do? That's actually a great question. One of the, uh, one of the ideas we had through our national program, we had several of these initiatives. One of them was uh, reaching out to the uh, bloggers on social media, and we had about 30 of them who are most influential here in the Middle East, not the UAE, but all of um, We calculated them through one of these social media leaders, uh, a conference that was taking place in Dubai. Amongst them, I think there were maybe 30 or 50. They had 100 people to influence. Can you imagine? This is like a, you know, heads of states <laughs> embarking on their own society. So uh, yes, they have power. And this power we all need to capitalize on and make sure that they understand the responsibility of what they have and they can actually influence their followers uh, on it. But definitely, this, uh, this is a new media. We used to, to say that the uh, fourth power state is usually media, but now social media is the fifth. Right. It's, a, it's a power of its own. Is there a way that you would want to regulate it? it? Huh? Would you like to be able to regulate it? Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not a person who would actually yeah. um, state that, but I, I think we have seen over Twitter and maybe, I don't know, Facebook or others were saying that at certain points, if there are some rhetorics that are, not, that are considered inappropriate, that they will actually block you. Um, and and uh, you, have to be, you have to balance between how much you can do with that. This, this is a technology that you can't stop. Right. And it's just gonna get faster, it's gonna get new technologies coming, so. Um, every technology that came about had its resistance and had control, but it doesn't work. We're, we're just moving on a one-way bullet train. <laughs> Sorry, a hyperloop. I'm a computer engineer by what? origin, but I look at technology today. <laughs> I'm part of the IBM equipment and the HP that today they may consider it to be washing machine size. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's mind-boggling is where we're going. <laughs> Yes. Sheikh Lubna, uh, as, as Vice Chancellor of NYU Abu Dhabi, I can say that we are 
really deeply proud of being part of Abu Dhabi and the UAE for many reasons, but very central to that is the commitment to tolerance, uh, the commitment to teaching students to be tolerant, uh, and more than tolerant even, but empathic across differences in the world. Um, and uh, part of our educational effort, as you well know, is to join the, the best of liberal arts education, the intellectual and ethical development, with the development of, of students who can be uh, agents of a common humanity. Yes. And we really feel that that's central to the educational mission. So my question is about how one best incorporates that teaching uh, within undergraduate education. And we really do believe, if you look at the commitment to diversity that has developed across American universities or to environmental sustainability, you can influence undergraduate education yes. to really move into those things. Um, That's a good um, point. Why don't we? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. yeah. So I wonder what, how you would uh, suggest. Well, I, Al, I really appreciate that. As a student who graduated from a California State University of Chico, I still remember my best teachers. Best teachers become a legacy for students. And uh, for me, if, if I look back at my path of career, um, the best influence I had in terms of discipline, delivery, in terms of end results, it was really my professors. So I think the platform of universities worldwide, I mean here in the UAE, um, uh, it, it is very crucial that the professors remember that about themselves, that they will leave their mark on the students. And one of it is actually ethics, moral values. Um, you are there to influence their future and the way they look, they look up to you. And um, uh, every teacher can do that. Um, I have a basic formula at Zaid University as a president. Uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not an academic person. I'm an engineer who moved into politics. But for me, I had just simple formula. Whatever you don't like for your kids, you should not impose or encourage it to other kids. Mm -hmm. It's just as simple as that. If you think the values and the morals that you want to encourage and, 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 uh, and you know, give to your children, give the same to the students that you have. If you think something is not uh, appropriate, don't encourage it uh, at the university. It's just, it's as simple as that. You're an extended uh, professor in an academic environment is an extension of a community. Today, community is neighborhood. It's your, um, you know, your, your family, your extended family, your friends but universities as well. Um, and uh, at Zaid University, uh, uh, I believe that the, the program of volunteers is being socially responsible, advocating good values, uh, being in, uh, engaged in some of the social programs within the, within the society itself has introduced better students for me. Mm -hmm. um, because they, they become part, they become responsible and accountable at a, a young age. I think we and can see. I think you're doing the same here as NYU. And I, it's so uh, pleasant for us to be part of NYU here, but also to hear your wonderful words. I think they've been an inspiration to us all. So thank you for helping thank to you. host us, and thank you, Sheikh Alubna. <laughs>